Okay, today we're going to begin talking about complications of pregnancy. This is your ATI chapter 6, 8, and 9. So one of the things you want to educate your patients is on the danger si dangerous signs of pregnancy. So one of the things that can occur during pregnancy that you want to forewarn your patients is that they can have a sudden gush of fluid from the vagina that could be potentially their um, bag of waters had broken which especially if it's before the 37th week that can um, put this patient at risk for preterm labor. Anytime in pregnancy, there should never be any type of vaginal bleeding. If they, they do experience any bleeding, they definitely need to report it immediately. Any type of abdominal pain, um, they should also report it to the provider. Any persistent vomiting that doesn't subside, they also need to report it. Any type of epigastric pain that could be a risk for uh, preeclampsia, it's, uh, also with an addition with edema of face and hands. Any severe persistent headaches or blurred vision or dizziness, again, those are also can be signs of preeclampsia, which is elevated blood pressure. Anytime they have any chills with fever or with a temperature of 100.4, that can be an indication of infection. So some women can be at risk for preterm labor if they have a, uh, especially like a UTI infection or some kind of uh, STI infection, which is sexually transmitted infection, um, can put them at risk for preterm labor. If they have any painful urination or reduced urine output, that's also an indication of risk for infection. So they just definitely need to report this to their provider. Okay, so we're going to start talking about bleeding during pregnancy. So things that can occur in bleeding disorders can occur in early, mid, or late in pregnancy. The first trimester, women can experience spontaneous abortions, also known as miscarriages. They can have a molar pregnancy, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. Uh, second trimester, some women may experience uh, cervical insufficiency. That can be either due to the cervix is really short. And in third trimester, some women can experience placenta previa, abrupto placenta, or vasa previa. So let's talk about spontaneous abortions. So in pregnancy, it can be a terminated loss before any time before 20 weeks of gestation. That is the point of viability. Or fetal weight is less than 500 grams. It's very commonly known as miscarriage, like I said before. It usually will occur in the first trimester. And usually the risk factors for this can be if they have a chromosomal anomaly, uh, maternal illness, if the woman is advanced maternal age, usually after 35 years of age, if she's um, pregnant, that puts them at risk. If they have a premature cervical dilation, and you gotta remember that the cervix needs to remain closed throughout pregnancy and, and it starts to dilate when she's about to deliver. So if it happen, opens prematurely, that puts her at risk for a spontaneous abortion, especially if it's before 20 weeks. Um, anytime anyone that's smoking or does alcohol or substance abuse, that also puts them at risk for spontaneous abortion. Maternal malnutrition, if they're not eating adequately. If there's some sort of trauma or injury, so say if they got in a car accident or if they're in, in, involved in domestic violence, um, that could put them at risk. Um, again, intimate partner viol uh, violence, um, if their partner is... Um, physically abusing them. And usually it's most high in pregnancy, um, intimate partner violence, just because a lot of times the tension shifts to the mother and the baby. So sometimes a partner may get jealous and that can increase the risk of intimate partner violence. Anytime there's abnormalities in fetus or placenta that also can cause a spontaneous abortion. Okay, so there's several types of abortion, which is these are important to know the different types. So first we're gonna talk about threatened abortion. So this is a possible cramping with light to moderate bleeding. The cervix remains closed because this has to remain closed um, throughout pregnancy up until you deliver. Um, there's no tissue passed. Um, the ultrasound will indicate that the fetus is alive. Um, usually they'll require the woman to be on bed rest and no sex because again, you don't want to aggravate that um, and sometimes just the pelvic pressure can increase the risk of preterm labor. So they usually have them just on uh, modified bed rest to help. 
So again, think of threaten as like is you're gonna threaten to hit somebody, but you don't do it. Um, that's good. That's potentially what's happened here. The baby is threatening to want to come out, but it actually doesn't. The woman still remains pregnant. Inevitable, uh, inevitable abortion. It's moderate cramping, mild severe bleeding, and cervix begins to dilate with membranes or tissue bulging at cervix. So this place, it person is placed on bed rest and monitor and it waits evacuation of fetus and the monitor, um, the peri pad. So you just want to be looking out for any bleeding. So this basically, there's nothing you can do. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. She's going to lose a baby. And so you just kind of have to wait until um, it, the fetus passes through. Uh, incomplete abortion. The woman will have severe cramps, heavy and profuse bleeding. The cervix is dilated with partial fetal tissue or placenta pass. There's some retained product of conception. Uterus may be emptied or remaining tissue by dilation, evacuation, or vacuum extraction. So this basically what happens is that she has an abortion, but nothing, it doesn't completely come out. So there's still some sort of um, product of conception left inside. So of course that increases the risk for infection because she can't leave anything in her uterus. So the dilation and evacuation is kind of like some kind of scraping where they open in her, uh, dilate her cervix and they actually will remove um, those remaining tissue that's in there. Now a complete abortion, the woman will experience mild cramps, minimal bleeding, complete expulsion of uterine content, the cervix is closed, no tissue in cervical canal. So patient is monitored, emotional support is given, and give Rogram if indicated. So again, this one, everything just comes out, and um, there's nothing that's left inside. Now, a missed abortion where the woman may experience no cramps, none to brownish discharge. The fetus dies in utero, but it's not expelled. There's a retention of tissue, uterine growth, sepsis can occur. So a missed abortion is just that it's, um, it's, they, it remains inside. So it never, it almost just like an abortion happened, but it just never expelled. So, um, and again, this can increase the risk for infection. So that's why they have to go back and do that um, DNC, which is uh, dilation and evacuation. Then some women may experience reoccurring abortion, which is habitual, meaning that she has two or more consecutive, consecutive spontaneous abortion. It's usually caused by incompetent cervix, meaning it could be short cervix or just can't support the pregnancy, or their progesterone levels are inadequate to maintain pregnancy. Because what we learned is that progesterone is what maintains the pregnancy. And so if you don't have enough hormones, um, it, it causes, that's what causes the contractions. It will cause the contractions and it instead it's supposed to not cause those contractions during pregnancy and that's why it maintains a pregnancy. And sometimes it just, it's not, it's so low that it just causes these women to have abortions. So usually for, if they have these habitual abortions, if it's related to the incompetent cervix, they will do what's called a cerclage and they basically kind of sew up the cervix to reinforce um, the cervix and um, to prevent her from having abortion. And we'll talk about a little bit more in a couple slides that come next. Um, therapeutic abortion is usually an intentional termination of pregnancy to preserve the health of the mother. So this woman will have to have an abortion um, because of maybe uh, risk factors or it can be potentially life hazardous. Um, sometimes it may be like if, for, for instance, if a woman had cancer and it's a risk benefit for her to terminate the pregnancy because she needs to treat herself or um, or if it's just a life or death situation, this is where she would have to do this and this is more called a therapeutic abortion. Now elective abortion is an intentional termination of pregnancy for reasons other than the health of the mother. So this is just when people decide that not having a child is not the right time for them um, or, you know, they can't have any more children because life, you know, might be a lot of stresses in their life and then where they have to opt to terminate the pregnancy. So it's considered elective because they choose to do that. So here's just a picture of what it looks like for a threatened miscarriage. As you can see, it's the, ba the fetus is still intact, it's still in the uterus. Um, the next picture is the incomplete miscarriage where everything starts to come out. The inevitable miscarriage is just, there's nothing you can do about it, it's, it's going to happen. 
and then there's a miscarriage where you see the dead fetus and it just remains inside the uterus. So the type of laboratory tests they need to do is you need to do a hemoglobin hematocrit to assess for blood loss. They do white blood, they check the white blood cells to, to determine to see if there's any infection, especially if it's been retained in um, the uterus. Uh, they also will run, um, a, do a pregnancy test and check the progestin levels to confirm pregnancy and also to, if it's low levels, um, that can indicate as well miscarriage, of especially those progestin levels. They also check clotting factors and they also, and again we already said it, they check uh, for white blood cells. So diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, usually they will have an ultrasound to, to, to actually see if they get a heart, uh, fetal heart rate. Um, they also see if they can see any movement of the baby. Um, then they'll do an examination of cervix because that's determined if the cervix is shortened or has dilated. And then once, if it's needed that they need to have to go in and evacuate any tissue remaining, they'll do a dilatation and curatage or dilatation evacuation. So they're pretty similar um, procedures. And sometimes um, in order, for, like if, for instance, if they have a missed abortion, sometimes they'll give a Pitocin, so that's a synthetic drug that causes contractions so that the woman can actually expel out that fetus. So again, the nursing care that they'll provide is perform a pregnancy test, observe for color and amount of bleeding, and count pads, because again, we want to look out for any um, post, um, hemorrhage, okay, because we don't want the woman to bleed out. We want to maintain the client on bed rest, avoid any vaginal exams, especially if she's a threatened abortion, and you don't want to um, put her at risk by doing a, a vaginal exam, because you may accidentally you know, have her dilate a little a little bit and you don't want that to happen. Um, you want to administer medication for pain, determine how much tissue has passed and save past tissue for examination. Provide referral for client and partner for pregnancy loss support groups because although you know this is you know it doesn't matter how far along she is, um, it is considered a loss and so we want to make sure that we provide supportive care to these mothers. So there is uh, bereavement um, support groups that are out there for women who have experienced um, pregnancy loss or stillbirth, which can help them cope through this difficult time. So again, the medications that will be given is analgesics and sedatives. They'll be given prostaglandins. Um, that can help the woman dilate if she needs to, if, if she has like a missed abortion um, or if there's retained, it helps expel it out. Um, again, they'll probably give the woman antibiotics because of the risk for infection or they'll give it as a prophylaxis to prevent it. And then they give program for RH negative mothers. So again, self-care after spontaneous abortion, uh, note, you want to tell the patient to notify the provider of heavy bright red vaginal bleeding, any elevated temperature or foul smelling or brown discharge. Um, a small amount of discharge is normal for one to two weeks. They want to refrain from tub baths, sexual intercourse, or anything in the vagina for at least two weeks. And you want to recommend that they take ibuprofen to help control painful cramps. Resume regular activity until feeling well. Grief and counseling is beneficial. And so you want to provide um, support groups that they can attend. And they want them to return to the healthcare provider at the recommended time for a checkup and contraception and, and give them contraception information. And you want to recommend that they avoid becoming pregnant for at least two months before they try again. All right, I want to talk about abnormal um, implantation of fertilized alveum, which is a topic pregnancy. So this basically what happens is that instead of the baby, the fetus implanting in the uterus, it actually it stays in the fallopian tube because as we remember, the fertilization occurs in the ampulla, which is in the fallopian tube. But what happens is, is that in supposed to once it's fertilized, it's supposed to travel on through to the uterus and embed on the uterine wall. But instead, in this case, it stays and embeds in the fallopian tube. And so what happens is, is that it can eventually, as the fetus begins to grow, because it's not supposed to be housed in there, um, it can cause the tube, tube to rupture, which can cause a fatal hemorrhage. So 
Usually the risk factors for a patient to have an atopic pregnancy, if they had an infection in their fallopian tubes, if they have endometriitis, or pelvic inflammatory disease, and usually what causes a pelvic inflammatory disease if you have a sexually transmitted infection that is not treated can cause pelvic inflammatory disease. So it can cause scarring in the uterine wall, which if it has scarring, then the, that makes it hard for the baby to implant in the uterus. Uh, if the woman had a history of prior atopic pregnancy, it can also increase the risk for having another atopic pregnancy any type of tubal surgery or multiple elective abortions can put her at risk. Uh, if she has an IUD, um, can also put her at risk because um, there has been situations where the IUD is like a little T that stays in the uterus and sometimes if it gets misplaced or um, it moves around, it's not in, in its correct position, it can... Um, not allow once it fer when she becomes pregnant, it won't allow for that to go into the uterus. So it will just stay in the fallopian tube. So that's why it increases the risk of atopic pregnancy if you have an IUD. Again, if the woman had any type of infections or adhesions in her uterus, that can also put her at risk. So the expected findings is usually there's a unilateral stabbing pain and tenderness in the lower abdomen quadrant. So they'll be, be on one side that they'll feel this pain. And there's a delayed one to two weeks lighter than usual or irregular menses. And she'll have a scant dark or brown vaginal spotting occurs six to weeks after normal mens menstrual cycle. If, they, if the tube ruptures, they are referred to um, shoulder pain due to blood and peritoneal cavity irritating the diaphragm or frankenurk after tubal rupture. They'll have this red vaginal bleeding and they usually will have signs of hypovolemic shock. So they'll have tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, decreased urine output, cold, clammy skin, and uh, pale or faintness. So the laboratory um, test that they do on these patients is that they'll do a serum level of progesterone and, and, hem, um, and the HDG ele and elevated rules out ectopic pregnancy. Um, they'll also um, do a transvaginal ultrasound um, to determine if it's a uterine pregnancy because um, otherwise it can detect if it's not in the uterus and then they could see it, visualize it if it's in the fallopian tube. So rapid treatment will be uh, medical management if the if rupture has not occurred and tube preservation desired. So usually what they'll do is give them methotrexate which inhibits cell division and embryo enlargement to dissolve the pregnancy. The only thing that we have to educate, and the, I'm sorry, let me go back. So the way this works, um, it causes it to stop the cells from dividing. So making that um, baby grow. So um, one of the things that they have to be educated on this is that they cannot have any alcohol consumption and folic acid to, because it will prevent toxic responses to medication. So when they have, um, were given this medication, they'll be given by injection and usually just one dose is given. They will need to come in to have a blood test to monitor, monitor the levels of pregnancy hormone in the blood. Um, eventually the methotrexate will stop the pregnancy and the level of pregnancy hormone in your blood, the blood should decrease over two to four days. And so most of the time women who are on this medication, they'll experience mild to moderate cramps or pain in the abdomen and they'll have vaginal bleeding like a period. And usually they'll have to do um, blood tests two to three times a week, and they can do it up to three weeks sometimes, and this can tell if the methotrexate is working to stop the pregnancy. So they'll start to see low levels of um, HCG levels. So again, the side effects for this medication, it causes nausea vomiting for 24 hours, decreased appetite, they can cause sores in the mouth, headache, they can feel really tired, uh, they may have redness, swelling, or pain at the injection site, have trouble sleeping, um, diarrhea, and hair loss is rare. So with these patients, if they're nauseous on this medication, they just recommend sip clear fluids like ginger ale or soup broth and try to drink often as, um, or eat small amounts of dry starchy foods like soda crackers every 15 minutes. If they're experiencing any mouth sores, just recommend that they gently brush their teeth at least twice a day with a soft toothbrush 
and then they should be rinsing their mouth uh, four times a day with club soda or water. Uh, they want to avoid any hot or spicy foods. And then for um, they, these patients, um, what they also need to know is that they must not get pregnant for at least three months after having methotrexate. Um, so again, if they are sexually active, they need to use a reliable birth control method, birth control method in the meantime. Um, the other thing that they can get um, is, is salpingostomy, which is done to savage the fallopian tube if it's not ruptured, or they can do a um, salpingectomy, which is a removal of the tube um, performed when the tube is ruptured. Or, um, so that can you that usually is done laparoscopically. For the nursing care, you want to administer medications, IV fluids, obtain the serum HCG and progestin levels. Um, you also want to check liver and renal functions, especially when they're on methotrexate, and to check their CBC and, and type in, uh, and cross for their RH if, they, if you don't know what their um, blood type is. Again, you want to prep the client for surgery and post-operative care if they have to have a salpingostomy or a salpingectomy. And again, you want to provide referral for pregnancy, pregnancy loss support group. And again, supporting and encouraging the grieving families uh, who suffer pregnancy loss, such as spontaneous abortion, allows them to resolve their grief. Um, spiritual support of the family choice and community support groups may help the family work through the grief and any loss. Okay, so we're going to talk about gestational trophoblastic disease, which is also known as hydiform mole or molar pregnancy. They kind of use those words interchangeably. So what this is, is basically it's a proliferation and degeneration of tropoblastic villi in the placenta that become swollen, fluid filled, and take on the appearance of a grape cluster. The embryo fails to develop beyond a primitive state, and usually this is associated with choriocarcinoma, metastasizing mal a malignancy. So there's two types of the GTD. There's a complete mole or there's a partial mole. There's... Um, and usually the risk factor for this is uh, it's prior molar pregnancy or early teens or, or if you're over 40 years old. And so just to go back to the complete so that you know what it is a little bit better, uh, the complete mole contains no fetus, placenta, or amniotic membranes, the placenta, or no placenta. And sometimes these patients may hemorrhage in the uterine cavity that may occur through the vaginal bleeding that can lead to cancer. For partial mole, the genetic material is derived from both maternal and maternal, maternal and paternal. A normal ovum is fertilized by two sperms or am abnormal embryonic or fetal parts can or congenital anomalies are present. So what are the expected findings? They have this bleeding is often brown. Usually they like to describe it like prune-like color. They have uh, their HCG levels higher than expected for gestational age and causing nausea and vomiting. So what's happening is that these cells are growing so rapidly, but it's not really creating a fetus. I like to think of it as, as when you think of like a, a snowball effect, like it's the snow that just keeps growing, 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 as it keeps rolling down the hill, the ball keeps getting bigger. So that's what kind of is happening here. This, these are just cells that are just kind of proliferating and it's not really creating anything and instead um, it is producing these HCG levels and so that's why we, when we go back to um, pregnancy tests when we talked about the pregnancy test being uh, it's not a positive sign because of this situation because it's going to give you high levels of HCG levels which may indicate pregnancy but really that's not what is occurring here. And so these women will not only have a high level um, HCG, but they are really nauseous and they have experienced a lot of vomiting as well. So, um, and also because it's growing so much rapidly, if you look at their, to assess their fundus, um, their belly, it's going to be larger than usual for that reason that these cells are rapidly growing. And usually when they do the ultrasound, that's when they will confirm what's in the uterus, but also they, they won't be able to hear any fetal heart tones. So there's no um, heartbeat. And then when they look at, 
if they do a transvaginal ultrasound, it reveals like grape-like clusters of vesicles that fill the uterus. So, and also they have like a, so, a snowstorm pattern depending on the ultrasound used. So usually you, you want to check their serum level, their HCG persistently high compared with expected decline after 10 to 12 weeks of pregnancy. Again, the, the diagnostic test would be an ultrasound, which reveals a dense growth with characteristics vesicles, but no fetus in utero. They'll do a suction curatage is done to aspirate and evacuate the mole to preserve fertility. Some women will, um, will opt to have an abdominal hysterectomy if they don't desire to have children. Um, they need to continue to follow up for at least one year is extremely important. And it, H levels will be tested uh, weekly after molar pregnancy, then for six months up to a year to detect uh, molar pregnancy. So you want to monitor vaginal bleed and discharge, monitor fundal height, monitor for preeclampsia, uh, chemotherapeutic medication for findings for malignant cells indicating choriocarcinoma, uh, provide a referral for client and partner to pregnancy loss and support group, uh, provide education and emotional support, you want to monitor vitals, administer program to RH negative mother, and disseminate, and this also look out for disseminated intravascular coagulation. Okay, so let's talk about placenta previa. So placenta previa occurs when the placenta implants in the lower segment of the uterus near or over the cervical os instead of attaching to the uterine wall. So basically what happens is um, they either have, they have uh, three types of different um, placenta previa. So you either have a marginal low-lying placenta, an incompetent or partial placenta previa or complete. Usually occurs in the third trimester is when they start having this abnormal bleeding. Um, I actually had placenta previa with my first pregnancy, and I actually had a complete placenta previa. So I always like everyone would always say that I, I was cursed as a nurse uh, because I had this. Um, it was very unheard of uh, for me to have this. And so what happens in this situation is that you have um, your placenta normally should, and I'm going to switch to the next picture here. If you look at picture A, you have the placenta that's kind of on the top where it, it actually embeds. But sometimes if you look at, num at B, the mar it's like marginal. So the cervix is on the bottom. The cervix needs to be closed. So if this um, marginal usually will, as the baby grows, sometimes the placenta will start to move up. But if you have this partial, it's partially covering that cervical opening. This can correct itself or may not correct itself. It just really depends. The other um, is number D, if you look at that, is complete. So the whole cervical opening is covered by the placenta. Okay, so when we think about this, and I'll go back to um, what happens is, is that these women will, if that gets aggravated if the baby moves or anything like that, it can cause this painless bright red vaginal bleeding with no warning. Okay, the uterus is soft and, and non-tender and fetus um, can be in any position, but we need, um, usually they'll have a reassuring heart, fetal heart rate. So the big risk factor with this is that it can potentially, if she this woman goes into labor and this placenta is sitting right there, we know that the placenta is a lifeline to the baby if the woman starts to dilate, that placenta can detach off and basically cut, cut, cut off the blood supply to the baby, which cause, gives them oxygen and nutrients, and the baby could potentially die. Okay, so with these situations, they have to be very careful. And so most of these women will not be able to deliver, depending if it hasn't corrected itself. So usually they'll have them um, deliver usually before 37 weeks, because usually around 38 to 40 weeks is when a nor normally a woman will start to um, go into labor. So they don't even want these women to even go into labor. So I actually had to deliver my son at 37 weeks um, because of that reason. And I had many episodes, and this usually kind of happens towards the end, um, towards the end in the third trimester, you start experiencing these uh, vaginal bleedings, and it's probably one of the scariest moments um, to have that happen to you. Um, just bright red bleeding just gushes out and without any warning, and um, 
it was pretty and you, these women have anxiety I remember having anxiety just rushing to the hospital and experience that so it was definitely a very hard um, time when I was going through my pregnancy with my son but thankfully everything was okay so risk factors for this um, it could be a woman had multifetal um, pregnancies older than 35 years old um, if they had a previous c-section they have any uterine scarring uh, if they smoked or previous placenta previa or close space pregnancy, which again, I didn't have any of those factors. So that's why people would say I was just cursed as a nurse to have that situation. So we already went over the pictures. So um, laboratory tests, they'll check for hemoglobin and hecratocrit for uh, blood loss. They will run, in, run a blood type and RH factor. They'll do a coagulation prof, uh, profile. They do fetal monitoring for, uh, for fetal well-being. They will also do a Clary Beck de uh, test to detect fetal blood and maternal circulation. And avoid, one of the things you have to recommend is that they have to avoid digital exam until ruled out um, placenta brevia. Because again, if they do a digital vaginal exam, that can potentially um, put that woman at risk um, for that placenta to detach. Okay, so that's why they just avoid um, digital exams altogether until they rule it out. Um, they also do ultrasound to detect placement of the placenta uh, because they want to detect where it's at um, to ensure if it's to determine whether it's partial, marginal, or complete. And they maintain the pregnancy. They want to maintain the pregnancy as long as they can go, and they'll um, until the fetal lung develops. They will put the woman on modified bed rest. Um, they'll constantly do non-stress tests to make sure that the baby's doing well. And um, they'll do cesarean deliveries if needed for complete placenta previa. So you want to assess for bleeding, leakage, or contractions, uh, monitor vitals, uh, refrain from performing vaginal exams, administer IV fluids. You want to assess the fundal height. Refrain from performing vaginal exams, um, administer IV fluids, blood products, and medications such as corticosteroids. So again, because she's at risk for preterm labor, they will give them um, bethamidazone to um, help promote the lung maturity of the fetus, just in case she delivers early. So again, monitor fetal heart rate and contractions, uh, administer program to RH negative mother. Um, they need to do fetal kick count to assess to make sure that the baby is moving. And they'll have vaginal rest, so there's no sex, no douching, no tampons for these women once they're confirmed that they have placenta previa. The next one we're going to talk about is abrupto placenta, which is a little different. So here in the picture, you have an attached placenta on the first picture. And then on the second one, you have a detached placenta. So basically, the placenta detaches from, detaches from the uterine wall. This usually can happen in the third trimester and it can be a partial or complete and this can be very dangerous because again we know that the placenta is a lifeline to the baby and if that uh, placenta detaches it the baby loses all oxygen nutrients and everything and potentially can kill the baby so and it also can have effects on the mother because she can go have um, some really strong pains and she can have be at risk for postpartum hemorrhage so the risk factors for this is maternal hypertension because again when you think about hypertension it restricts the blood flow when you got to think always think pathophysiology if you have restricted blood flow then because of high blood pressure then how do you think that's going to affect the baby you got to remember where your the mother is the lifeline to the baby if her blood vessels are not functioning to the full capacity, then that restricts the baby to get oxygenation as well as nutrients and everything else. So it increases that risk for placenta abruption. Cocaine is a vasoconstrictor. So it constricts the artery, arteries and veins. So again, that puts at risk for placenta abruption. Cigarette smoking is also a vasoconstrictor. Any type of trauma or blows to the abdomen. I actually had a former student who shared with us, uh, who was courageous to share with us that her first um, child, that she suffered a placenta abruption um, due to 
her dog jumping on her and she had a little dog but the dog jumped on her stomach and caused her to have an abrupt placenta which was really sad so again anytime a woman goes through has a trauma or sometimes it could be um, physical trauma or even a car accident they definitely need to go into the hospital and get checked out any previous history of abruption placenta smoking um, premature ruptured membrane or multifetal pregnancy can um, put them at risk so manifestations it's a little different um, from the placenta previa because this one is sudden onset of intense localized uterine pain with dark red vaginal bleeding. Then they have um, the area of the uterine tenderness can be localized or diffused over the uterus and it feels very bored like. And so again they have that dark red vaginal bleeding and um, they'll have contractions with hypertonicity the fetal, and, they may have, and they'll have fetal distress. So they'll put her on the monitor and sometimes the heart rate can be going down for the baby and it can lead to hypovolemic shock. So you, um, for to test for this, laboratory test that you'll do is the H, um, HC, um, sorry, the hemoglobin hematocrit for blood loss. They'll do a CBC. They'll check the blood type and RH factor if they haven't done that already. They'll do a coagulation profile. They'll uh, monitor the fetus and they'll also do that Clara Becky test. And again, they also want to do um, avoid any digital exam until they ruled out that they have a placenta abruption. Uh, diagnostic testing, um, they'll have an ultrasound um, to test the fetal well-being. They'll do a biophysical profile. Um, so you want to palpate the uterus for uterus and tone, monitor vitals and fetal heart rate. Um, most of the time, this will require immediate birth is the management. So they'll require most likely a C-section which is more of an emergency section. They'll administer IV fluids, blood products, and medication as prescribed. They'll administer o oxygen via face max, at least 8 to 10 liters. They'll monitor vital signs and assess urine output and fluid balance. Another um, thing that can happen in during pregnancy is that there can be a loss of an ex um, which was called intrauterine fetal demise which is a fetal death and the death of fetus in utero at over 20 weeks. So this is not the same like a spontaneous abortion is happens, anything that happens before 20 weeks. Now this is anything that happens over 20 weeks is what we call a fetal demise. So usually the causes of this can be either something genetically or congenital anomaly or infection. It could be something due to the placenta. So like the placenta abruption, if they have a cord accident, uh, premature rupture of membrane. It can be even a twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. Sometimes babies, um, they share like the same placenta, but one will get more than the other. Um, sometimes it's unknown. Sometimes it could be maternal, which it could be uh, advanced maternal age. Uh, it could be a medical disorder such as diabetes, um, hypertension. So usually these women um, that's why they closely monitor them on non-stress tests all the time. Uh, it could be preeclampsia, eclampsia. We'll talk about those next. Um, RH disease or uterine rupture or infection. So usually they'll induce labor as soon as possible after they determine that there is a fetal death. So, you know, when they have this, they have intervention for grieving process. Um, so again, you want to provide support and listen to your patient. So this is where that therapeutic communication comes in and is key. Sometimes just sitting there with the patient and just listening or just being in silence and just holding her hand, um, just showing that you're there for that person. You know, you want to allow the parents to remain together in the privacy. So you do allow them to see the baby. Um, sometimes they will opt, most parents do opt to see the baby, but sometimes they, they don't. Even if they don't, usually what the hospital will do is they'll take pictures of the baby and keep them on file so that in the event, once the mom is ready to see the baby, some, they can at least um, see pictures of the baby. So again, you want to develop a plan of care to provide support to the family. Usually offer a memento um, box, such as like the footprints. They usually put like the baby's hat. Um, the birth certificate in there and the blanket. Um, again, you want to offer the opportunity for them to hold the infant um, and you want to 
provide parents with educational materials and referrals to support groups. And also you want to discuss wishes concerning religious and cultural rituals. Some parents will um, choose to have a funeral while some people may not opt to do that. It's really up to the discretion of the family. And usually they'll have um, a pastor or, or someone, a grievance person to help them through that if they wish to do any of that. Um, one of the things I found was really interesting was this cuddle cots and I encourage you to watch this video that's on this link. Um, this video um, talks about the cuddle cots so that actually what you're seeing in that room is actually like a little small um, bassinet and it has that blue machine. Basically that blue machine keeps the preserves the baby to keep it cold because normally they can't have if they're not in cold it, it the body starts to decompose. So what they do is it has, it's like a cooling method that the baby sits in and it allows the baby to stay a little longer with the parents. And the video really shows the impact that that simple device had on families who lost their child and, and how it meant to them just being able to have more time with their baby. So I encourage you to watch it. Okay, so we're going to shift gears and move to medical conditions during pregnancy, which is chapter 8 in your ATI. So I kind of briefly talked about the cervical insufficiency, which is a variable condition where expulsion of the products of conception occurs. It is thought to be related to tissue changes and alterations in the length of the cervix. So risk factors for this is the history of cervical trauma uh, in utero exposure to a, to a certain medication, which I'm not going to even try to pronounce. It's usually ingested by the client's mother during pregnancy, which can cause structural defects of the uterus or cervix. So expected findings, a woman experienced increase in pelvic pressure, to, which causes them to have this urge to push. They may have um, pink stained vaginal discharge or bleeding, possible gush of fluids, um, uterine contraction with dysfunction of the fetus, Postoperative soclage is recommended and monitoring for uterine contractions, brain, uh, rupture membranes, and signs of infection. So usually with the ultrasound, when they do a, a preferably um, the, pro, the vaginal uh, ultrasound, they actually will be able to measure the cervix. And if it's less than 25 centimeters or their cervical funneling or facement, that can confirm that they have uh, cervical insufficiency. So usually the prophylactic, they'll do that cervical cerclage, which is done at 12 to 14 weeks. And that usually um, will be removed between 36 and 38 weeks or unless the, um, there's spontaneous labor and then they'll do it at that point to remove it. So it's just kind of like a little suture to hold it um, tight and closed. So usually for these women, they'll give them a tocolytic uh, medication, which that basically stops the contractions from occurring. Um, you want to evaluate the client's support system because, again, this can be very scary for the patient, especially when they're at risk of losing their baby. Um, so you want to provide that support. Assess vaginal discharge and monitor client's report of pressure and contractions and assess vital signs. Um, again, place the client on activity restriction or bed rest. Encourage hydration to promote relaxed uterus. Uh, avoid intercourse, tampons, douche, and monitor uterine changes. Provide education on preterm labor and instruct the client to follow up with their provider. And it's 10 o'clock, just FYI. Uh, hyperemesis gravidum. This is when it causes severe nausea and vomiting that is prolonged past 12 weeks of gestation and usually results in 5% weight loss from pre-pregnant weight. And they have, uh, usually the difference is that they'll have an electrolyte imbalance because most women will, have, um, will experience nausea and vomiting in the first trimester. But this one is basically it past those 12 weeks. But the big key with this one is that it causes weight loss because they can't hold anything down and because they're constantly throwing up it causes this electrolyte imbalance and it can cause ketosis and acetonuria. So the risk factor for this is women that are less than 30 years old or they have a history of migraines, they can um, diabetes, first pregnancy, mal uh, multiple gestation. Again, that molar pregnancy can cause um, the hyperemesis, stress, or any type of GI disorders. 
So expected findings, um, they'll have severe nausea and vomiting, they will have um, dehydration, so they'll have a dry tongue, mucous membrane is dry, they'd have decreased skin turgor, they will have weight loss, so every time they come into you know to their prenatal visit, we weigh them to see if there's any changes. Um, again, the big thing is that electrolyte imbalance. Um, so this, uh, they will have sometimes experience hypokalemia, which is not good. Um, they will have elevated um, hematocrit, increased pulse, and decreased blood pressure. Okay, so those are important to know. Uh, so the lab test, they will usually do a urinalysis for ketones and acetones, which is a breakdown of protein and fat. And, and um, they also do a chemistry profile to reveal any electrolyte balance, especially they'll be looking at sodium, potassium, chloride um, to see if they're reduced. Um, metabolic acidosis to secondary to starvation. They'll also look at metabolic alkalosis to see if the, that's usually will cause by excessive vomiting. Um, they'll check their elevated liver enzymes and then they'll do a CBC to uh, also to check the concentration, um, the hematic concentration elevated due to ability to retain fluids. And they also may run a thyroid test as well. So the first thing we want to do is correct the fluid electrolyte imbalance. So you want to give them IV fluids, normal saline or lactators ringer, you want to give them potassium given at a low level. Um, they'll, they'll recommend vitamin um, B6 because that can help with the hyperemesis. Um, ginger has also been known to um, help with um, women that experience vomiting. So there's like ginger teas, ginger candy um, that they can uh, take. Um, sometimes they'll recommend antiemetics like oldestestrone or metoclopramide um, to also help if it's really severe. And basically, you just want to make sure that you also address nutrition because it's very important and you want to have them at least eat. So you want to administer medications with IV fluids as nurses. We want to assess emesis and document INO and monitor lab values and monitor vitals. So we have iron deficiency anemia. So this usually occurs during pregnancy due to inadequacy in maternal iron storage and consuming insufficient amounts of dietary iron. So usually the risk factor is less than two years between pregnancy. They have a heavy menstrual cycle. They have a diet low in iron. They have multifetal gestation, vomiting frequently due to morning sickness. So your expected findings is that this woman is always going to experience fatigue and weakness. They'll have irritability, headache, feeling dizziness or lightheadedness. They have shortness of breath, palpitations, cravings, usually um, usually uh, foods like pica. So pica is, um, as you recall, these are non-food items. So suddenly they will like to eat dirt, chalk, um, laundry, the laundry detergent, um, just random things that are just not food. They will also have physical findings of pallor, so they look really pale, they have brittle nails, and they have shortness of breath. So usually the laboratory will determine that they have a hemoglobin less than 11 in their first and third trimester, and they have their, um, and in, sec in second trimester they have 10.5, and their hematocrit is usually less than 33%. So you want to recommend that these patients have a, a diet rich in iron, so they have to take anywhere from 60 to 100 milligrams a day if deficient. They want to encourage them to increase iron dietary intake, which eating legumes, fruit, green leaf, and vegetables, and meat to help um, increase their iron. Um, and educate on ways to minimize ad, um, GI adverse effects. So sometimes if, you know, they need it, um, if their iron's really low, they'll give them ferrous sulfate iron supplements. So with this, you want to instruct the client to take the supplement on an empty stomach if it's tolerated and take with orange juice because that will increase the absorption. Encourage a diet rich in vitamin C containing foods to increase absorption. Again, increase roughage and fluid intake in diet to assist with discomfort or constipation. And they may have black tarry stool. Um, so this is very important that um, we educate them because they might um, freak out a little bit if um, they see this and they're not told and um, they see their stool like that. Um, also, 
They may give the moms um, iron dextron, which the iron dextron is an oral iron supplement. So if, um, some, especially for women that cannot tolerate sometimes taking the oral medication, um, but just keep in mind with this that um, they need to take it with a straw because otherwise if they just take the medication, it actually can cause staining in the teeth and you want to prevent that from happening. All right, let's move on to gestational diabetes. So this is a disorder which there is an inadequate insulin to move glucose from the body into the body cells. So the ideal blood sugar for most people is 70 to 110. Those um, values may vary depending on the patient as well as depending on different facilities. So what happens here is that usually the symptoms will disappear after they have their de after they deliver. 50% of women develop type 2 diabetes um, mellitus within five years. So if they have this diabetes, they, they're at risk for developing it. So usually what happens, the effects of pregnancy on the glucose metabolism, it's usually caused by the hormones, estrogen and progesterone, uh, insulase, enzymes, and increased prolactin levels have two effects. They increase resistance of cells to insulin and increase speed of insulin breakdown. So one of the things that we got to be worried about is that it increases the risk for spontaneous abortion, infections. Usually women, they're prone for in a urinary or vaginal due to increased glucose and decreased resistance due to altered metabolism. They may cause them to ha uh, have hydromios, which is um, a lot of, uh, they might have a lot of fluids. Um, I'm sorry, their amniotic fluid is high. Ketoacidosis, which is a diabetic genic effect of pregnancy, which increases insulin resistant uh, with untreated hypoglycemia. Um, they may have hypoglycemia if they're on insulin. They have overdosing or skipped or late meals. Increased exercise may put them at risk for hypoglycemia. Or hypoglycemia can cause excessive fetal growth for macrosomia. So one of the things you got to remember is that they have all these, you know, these women, the insulin is what, um, is that lock and key is, is what goes that it actually takes the glucose into their cells but in this case it's not taking that glucose so this blood glucose is just swimming in the bloodstream and so what happens is is that the baby his pancreas is is working fine this page be instead is taking all that extra glucose that's floating in the bloodstream and it's causing this baby to keep getting bigger and bigger. So you got to kind of think about like that Pac-Man that is going around and just eating the food up and just keeps eating the food up and the baby just keeps getting this nutrients, this glucose and that's what's causing this baby to get big and that's what we call macrosomia. The other risk factor is um, we have obesity, uh, hypertension, glycosuria, the maternal age older than 25, their family history, and previous delivery of large baby or stillborn. So we have the expected findings will be for hypoglycemia. So patients will experience nervousness. They'll experience headache, uh, weakness, irritability, hunger, uh, blurred vision, tingling of the mouth. Um, sometimes they'll have hyperglycemia which is polydipsia, the three P's, polydipsia, polyphagia, polyuria. So they'll have, um, they're extreme thirsty, they will eat more, and they'll have uh, urinate more. They'll have nausea, abdominal pain, flushed, um, dry skin, or fruity breath. They also, physical findings will notice that they'll be shaking, clammy pale skin, shallow respirations, rapid respirations, vomiting, excessive weight gain during pregnancy. They'll have a biophysical profile to ascertain fetal well-being. They'll have, sometimes they may opt to have an amniocentesis with alpha fetal protein or a non-stress test. So again, want to monitor their client's blood glucose and monitor the fetus. So routine tests. We want to do a urinalysis at every visit because we want to assess for the presence of ketone. 
Um, 24 to 28 weeks is when they have their testing. They'll have a one-hour glucose screening test, um, or sometimes known as a glucose challenge test. Um, no fasting is necessary. They just come in, um, preferably in the morning, and then they'll be given um, the, a drink. And they'll have to, it's very sugary drink, and uh, it basically just see how your body metabolizes the sugar. And um, if you have a score of 140 over 140, less than 140, it's normal. But if it's higher than that, then the person um, obviously failed that screening test, and now they have to have a diagnostic test. So what they'll have to have to do is come in and have the three-hour glucose tolerance test. So for this one, they have to fast overnight, usually 12 hours prior to their procedure. Um, they have to avoid caffeine, and they can't eat anything, so they have to fast. Um, so for the first blood draw, they'll do a fasting blood draw, and then they will give them this drink to drink, and they can't eat anything at all, and only thing is they can have is water, and so at the hour, they will take their blood draw, and then again, they will wait, and then at the two hour mark, they will take their blood draw again, and then they'll wait another hour till they reach three hours, and then they'll take another um, drink. They have to stay scheduled to stay in the hospital or where the clinic, wherever they're getting their blood draw, for at least those three hours. They have to stay for the three hours. At any point, if they don't do it right on time, then it delays it, and then they'll have to repeat it again. So it's not in their best interest. So anytime any of those values, if there's two or more of those values do not meet or exceed the level, then they automatically are told that they have gestational diabetes. So with my son, I also had this. So it didn't matter your weight, if you're thin, it, or... Um, obese, it doesn't matter. This can affect anybody, and it affected me. The only um, good thing about it was that um, I was just uh, put on a diet um, controls, so I didn't have to take any insulin or any um, oral hypoglycemic medication. So again, um, with this, you want to um, provide if during labor, they may have to have, if they're on insulin, they may have to um, be on an IV to receive dextrose, uh, maybe given insulin, and blood glucose will be checked hourly and adjust insulin administration. Uh, for the baby, the way this affects the baby is that it can cause hypoglycemia because this baby is so used to getting so much um, glucose because it just keeps eating and eating, you know, getting these nutrients because of all this glucose that's just in the bloodstream. So once the baby is born and now they have to depend on themselves and so usually their blood sugars would drop. So they have to assess their blood sugars at least three times before each feeding to detect if they're hypoglycemic. They may experience respiratory distress, these babies, because again, hypoglycemic can cause them to have respiratory distress. Um, they can be have uh, injury related to macrosomia because these babies are large. Some of these babies can be uh, over, 10, over 9 to 10 pounds even. I've seen as far as 11 pounds. So again, that can be very traumatic to not only baby, but to the mom as well. Sometimes they may have to do an, uh, a C-section if they're too large. Um, again, they're closely monitoring the baby's glucose, and breastfeeding is encouraged. That actually helps increase their blood glucose. So you want to teach self-glucose monitoring if it's needed, um, medication administration. You want to teach them about signs and symptoms of hyperhypoglycemia, um, how to prevent UTIs because these women are increased for UTI, and if you have a UTI, that increases your risk for preterm labor. Um, you want to encourage to eat a healthy, balanced diet. Most of the times, they will first opt to send the mom to see a nutritionist, uh, nutrition, um, nutritionist, to um, help them um, get a balanced, uh, di usually diabetic diet. They will give them, um, and 
I remember having to do that and um, it was just hard because you have a lot of, I have a lot of empathy for diabetics because it's really hard to stay on a diabetic diet especially when it's carb controlled um, they have to you want to still encourage regular moderate exercise just walking swimming really helps providing emotional support because it can be a little scary having to know that you have diabetes and how it can affect you and the baby um, and that it carries, there's always that risk that you can develop it later on in life. So again, we want to treat it by monitoring the blood glucose, um, have their check sugars daily, teach them about signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, again, diet modification, so they'll consult with a dietitian, avoid large single meals, they'll have um, avoid high amounts of simple carbohydrates and three balanced meals and two snacks. So we're going to monitor their ketones, um, encourage exercise, insulin, um, depending if if it, that's the next step. If they can't get it on the if they can't get it under the glucose under control with diet, they'll have to opt for these. And again, they'll do a fetal assessment. So they usually do well non-stress tests, um, BPP and ultrasounds, because having diabetes puts the a mother at an increased risk of uh, fetal death. Um, for the same reason that because of the there is a decrease in oxygen may cause health damage to the baby as well as the if it's not if they don't have um, poor glycemic control the sugars are persisting high can cause blood vessel damage in the placenta and the poor oxygen and nutrients supply to the baby so it's all a domino effect there is a video that is uh, you can click the link and that can, and it talks about gestational diabetes which I recommend that you watch when you can so again here's just a di uh, little uh, picture of just indicating uh, about gestational diabetes and how um, it affects the baby alright so we're gonna move on to gestational hypertension so this is the second leading cause of maternal morbidity and mortality. There's a significant maternal and fetal danger. Uh, vasospasm co contributing to poor tissue perfusion. They're associated with placental abruption, kidney failure, hepatic rupture, preterm labor, and fetal and maternal death. So there's four different types of categories. There's gestational hypertension, mild preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia, eclampsia, and the HELP syndrome. So we'll discuss those shortly. So gestational hypertension is two episodes of elevated blood pressure, over 140 over 90 after 20 weeks. And there's no protein in the urine. So it, this is why when we talked about prenatal care, one of the things that they do every time is check their blood pressure to make sure it's not elevated. And they always do leave a urine sample and do a urine dipstick to assess to see if there's any protein in the urine. So for mild preeclampsia, the depression is gestational hypertensive she has protein urea plus one. They have headaches with possible irritability and edema can be present. And so we got to remember that women do experience um, edema on their lower extremities, but this is a little different. This is where they have the edema on their face and their hands. And they appear very swollen and sometimes they'll have periorbital uh, edema. And you'll see it in a, uh, in a couple pic, uh, slides to come. For severe preeclampsia, the woman has 160 over 110. Uh, blood pressure, her proteinuria is plus three or, or more. She has an elevated creatinine. Her she's maybe experiencing visual disturbances, hyperflexia with possible ankle clonus. So her her reflexes are hyperactive. She has peripheral edema, hepatic dysfunction, epigastric pain, or thrombocytopenia. Now, we want one of the things that can happen if this is not controlled if it leads to this next step it can be very very uh, at risk for the patient so if they have eclampsia severe ple preeclampsia that leads to the onset of seizure or coma preceded by headaches severe epigastric pain and hyperflexia and in hemo concentration so we don't ever want to get to this point because this is when it gets bad because you can just imagine you have a seizure you lose um, consciousness and you can potentially lose um, there's a interrupted blood flow and oxygenation so if she's pregnant that can increase the risk of fetal death or, or more uh, maternal morbidity so we need to um, intervene quickly and so that's why we never want to get to that point so um, once it 
the another uh, risk can be the HELP syndrome. So this is an acronym. So H stands for hemolysis that can cause anemia and jaundice. They have elevated liver enzymes, so elevated aniline amyl transferase or aspartate transaminase. Um, it causes epigastric pain and nausea and vomiting. They'll have low platelets, less than 100,000, uh, resulting in thrombocytopenia, which is abnormal bleeding and clotting time, bleeding gums, petechia, and possible disseminated intravascular coagul coagulopathy. So the risk factors for developing gestational hypertension is that if you have a family history of preeclampsia, eclampsia, uh, African-American descent, first pregnancy younger than 19-year-olds, older than 40-year-olds, multiple gestation, chronic renal disease, uh, morbid obesity, diabetes, chronic hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, or systemic lupus erythrosis. So the expected findings are symptoms They'll have this severe headache, nausea, blurred vision, flashes of light or dots before their eyes. So these are questions that we always ask them every time when they're, they come into their pre uh, prenatal visit. Are you experiencing nausea, blurred vision, flashing lights, blurred vision, you know, any of the lightheadedness. Um, and so we just want to make sure that they're not having any symptoms of hypertension. So... Here are the findings. Um, blood pressure over 140 over 90 after 20 weeks, at least two different occasions. Protein urine to urine, dipstick followed by 24-hour urine collection. So usually if they find the protein by the dipstick, remember that's a screening tool. So then what they'll do is they'll ask the patient, they'll give them this big jug, and they will have to collect the urine for, for the whole entire 24 hours. So um, they can't skip. Um, if they skip a uh, actual um, urine, um, not putting it in there, then they'll have to do the test all over again. So they have to do it the whole 24 hours. So again, like I mentioned before, they have this periorbital facial and hand and abdom abdominal edema. They'll have a pitting edema in lower extremities also. Um, they'll have vomiting, oliguria, which is a uh, little uh, urine, excessive weight gain. So they'll gain about two pounds per week. Hyperflexia, which is their reflexes are a little overactive. Uh, scotoma, which is loss of, oh, I missed that little word there. So I have to, uh, I can't think of it at the moment. Um, epigastric pain, they'll have right upper quadrant pain. Uh, dyspnea and diminished breath sounds. So the, again, the laboratory test is the enzyme, serum, creatinine, BUN, the uric acid, magnesium. They have CBC, clotting studies they'll have done, and chemistry profile will be done. Um, usually the normal findings that they will find is elevated liver enzymes, increased creatinine, increased plasmic uric acid, increased um, thrombocytopenia, decreased hemoglobin, and um, hyperbilirubinemia. And the diagnostic procedures, like I mentioned already, is 24-hour um, urine collection. They'll have um, non-stress test, contraction test, a BPP and ultrasound, and they'll have a Doppler blood flow for analysis. So the nursing care is assess uh, level of consciousness. You want to monitor pulse ox, monitor urine output, obtain daily weights, monitor BP, encourage lateral position, perform non-stress tests and daily kick counts, and monitor INO. So there's a low dose of aspirin therapy that is actually the new recommendation that they um, can give to help uh, thin out the blood. If they have a early, um, this can be get uh, started in first trimester who have a history of, of early onset preeclampsia. Otherwise, they could give them antihypertensive drugs. The first drug of choice is hydrolene, which is a vasodilator that can be given IV administration used for severe preeclampsia. You just want to be cautious with that because this can be used to prevent rapid decrease in BP. Rapid reduction in BP can increase ureteral placental perfusion and decrease oxygen to the fetus. Um, they'll give me uh, methyl dopa, may work on the central nervous system, may take a few days or onset not, not first choice in acute situations. 
Uh, lobetalol is given, it's the only thing you have to worry about, it slows the heart and decreases systemic vascular resistance. Or they sometimes give nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker and controls hypertension rapidly, can increase cardiac in index and increase urine output. So most of these women um, sometimes will be placed, if they're in the hospitalized, they will sometimes um, will have to be placed on a Foley catheter so that they can uh, measure their um, urine output. So anti-convulsive medication, which um, can be given, is mag magnesium sulfate. This is a medication of choice for prophylaxis of a treatment to lower blood pressure and depress uh, CNS to prevent seizures. So again, this drug is, has a good purpose because it we want to lower the blood pressure and also decrease the risk of them having a seizure. So the primary goal is to deliver a healthy baby, restore a woman's healthy state, preventing maternal seizures. With this drug, you have to be very careful. You have to maintain a therapeutic level of 4 to 7 milligrams DL. So because if you give too much of this, this can cause a toxic level. So that's why it's important to assess to see if there's any absence of patellar deep tendon reflexes. You check to make sure that their respirations um, are normal because if it's less than 12 or the urine output is less than 30 or they have decreased level of consciousness or ha start having cardiac dysrhythmias, um, usually if the serum level is over 8, that means is um, um, mag sulfate toxicity. So there's a little diagram on the side, so it's called the BURP. So how to identify uh, magnesium sulfate toxicity if they have blood pressures decrease, urine output decrease, and they have respirations is less than 13, and patellar reflex is absent. So everything pretty much is decreased. All right, so if magnesium toxicity is suspected, stop infusion immediately. You always want to have your antidote at your bedside. So you should always have calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. Um, prepare for actions to prevent respiratory uh, or cat cardiac arrest. So again, you want to educate the patient uh, to be on bed rest, um, promote diversional activities. You want to avoid foods high in sodium. Maintain a dark environment because, you know, you want to avoid a lot of stimuli. And maintain a paint and airway and administer antihypertension medication. If, granted, we don't want to ever get to this point, but in the event that you get to this point where the patient has eclampsia, this is where they'll have this clonic tonic seizure. They'll have, um, they can aspirate. They can have cerebral hemorrhage, stroke, hematic rap rupture. I'm sorry, hepatic rupture, placental abruption, possible death of woman or fetus, or they can have the HELP syndrome. So basically when you have a patient that is has a seizure, you want to make sure that you maintain an open airway. Okay, that's the most important. So remain with the client and call for help. If um, you want to turn the woman to the side, um, and if you can, suction her mouth to take any, um, if she has any uh, secretions to prevent uh, aspiration. Um, but usually if you turn on the side, it can help facilitate the drainage and clear the secretions. Um, if you can, administer uh, oxygen by face at 8 to 10 liters because, again, we want to protect the baby. Monitor fetal heart rate. Assist in administrating medication to control seizure as prescribed. After the seizure, insert an oral airway and su suction the client's mouth as needed. And prepare for delivery of the fetus after stabilization of the client and is if warranted. And again, you want to document the occurrence, the client's response, and outcome. So we kind of mentioned this before, the DIC, so I just wanted to give you a, a brief uh, description of what this is. Uh, disseminate intravascular coagulation, which is uh, a condition in which the small blood clots develop throughout the bloodstream, blocking small blood vessels. The increase with clotting depletes the, the platelets and clotting factors needed to control bleeding, causing excessive bleeding. Okay, so we're going to talk about early onset of labor, chapter 9. So preterm labor is a uterine contractions and cervical changes that occur between 20 and 37 weeks of gestation. So the risk factors, um, there are many risk factors that can cause a woman to go into preterm labor. 
They can either have infection, so UTI, vaginal, or chorioamnitis, which is uh, an infection of the membrane sac, okay, the, the amniotic sac, I'm sorry. Um, you can have previous preterm birth, multifetal pregnancy, hydramnios, age below 17 or above 17, I mean above 35, low socioeconomic status, smoking or substance abuse, intimate partner violence, history of miscarriage or abortion, diabetes, hypertension, preeclampsia, lack of prenatal care, premature dilation of cervix, placenta previa or placenta abrupto or abrupto placenta, I say it kind of interchangeably, preterm rupture membranes, short interval pregnancy, so that means like a woman who got pregnant and then three months later is pregnant after she just delivered the baby, um, uterine abnormalities, low pregnancy weight or bleeding. So usually expected findings um, that a woman may experience is uterine contractions, pressure in the pelvis and menstrual light -like cramping, persistent low back, ache, GI cramping, sometimes diarrhea, urinary frequency, and vaginal discharge. So physical findings that you observe is increased change of odor or blood in the vag or vaginal discharge, Change in cervical dilation, regular uterine contractions with a frequency of every 10 minutes or greater, and they last for at least an hour, or they have premature rupture of membranes. So the lab testing, they'll usually will do a fetal fibronectin test, and basically what that does, it's a swab test, okay, they will... Um, it's usually done around 24 to 34 weeks, and basically what it detects is if they can be um, protein that is released from the placenta indicating inflammation to the placenta that can lead to preterm labor. Um, they'll do uh, cervical culture suggests presence of infections and they'll run a CBC as well as urinalysis to detect to see if there's um, an infection such as a UTI that can put them at risk for um, preterm labor. So the diagnostic procedures obtain the fibronauts test, measure the cervical length, um, use home uterine activity monitoring, obtain uh, cervical cultures, and perform BPP and non-stress tests. So you want to maintain activity bed rest. I'm sorry, activity restriction, which is bed rest, which is left lateral position. Um, you should promote them to lay in because that increased blood flow to uterus and decreased uterine activity. They want to avoid um, sexual intercourse because that can put them at risk for preterm labor. Ensure hydration. Hydration stimulates pituitary gland to, to secrete an antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. And that if the oxytocin releases, stimulates uterine contractions. Identify and treating um, infections. Again, UTI, infl that's inflammatory triggers, labor, monitor vitals, and temperature and vaginal discharge. Chorioamniitis is infection of the amniotic sac, should be expected um, with the occurrence of fetal tachycardia, which is prolonged increase in the fetal heart rate over 160, and can indicate infection and it's associated with preterm labor. Um, also, monitor fetal heart rate and contraction patterns is very important, and, and looking out for also fetal tachycardia. So, Toca little medications, it's um, intended to uterine relaxants to um, stop the woman from going into preterm labor. So some drug uh, that they can give is nephetipine, which um, is a calcium channel blocker. It's used to suppress contractions by inhibiting calcium from entering the smooth muscles. The thing we've got to remember with that, it may cause flushing, dizziness, and nausea. It may cause orthostatic hypertension. So you want to encourage the patient to slowly change position and maintain adequate hydration. This can be given with mag sulfate or immediately following a beta adrenergic medication. Now mag sulfate in this situation kind of plays a doubled role. It can um, decrease the um, decrease the blood pressure and seizures in a preclamped patient, but then it could also um, be a uterine relaxant for the mother that's going into preterm labor. So what that does is it relaxes the smooth muscles of the uterus and thus inhibits uterine activity by suppressing contractions. It is contraindicated for tocolysis, including vaginal bleeding, dilated six centimeters, or choreo or 
are greater than 34 weeks and or if the baby is in acute fetal distress. So again, with this one, you have to monitor closely. DC therapy, if patient develops pulmonary edema, chest pains, uh, short of breast, respiratory distress, audible wheezing and crackles, um, productive cough with um, blood tinge fluid. Um, again, monitor for toxicity. Remember the, the, the BURP acronym, okay? So um, decreased breathing, decreased urine output, decreased um, reflexes, and usually, again, you want to have uh, calcium gluconate or calcium chloride at the bedside because that is an antidote to reverse any toxicity. Um, they could give endomethacine, which is a non anti-inflammatory that suppresses preterm labor by blocking the production of prostaglandins. The inhibition, inhibition of prostaglandins suppresses uterine contractions. The other medication is terbutaline which is administered sub-Q to stop uterine contractions. It has cardiac side effects, increased blood pressure, and BP. They must notify the uh, provider if the client reports blood vision, uh, headache, I mean, sorry, blurred vision, headache, nausea, vomiting, or difficult, or any difficulties. Um, they will give sometimes the mother a steroid medication, which is no commonly known as bethamidazone, which is a glucose uh, steroid is administer IM in two injections, 24 hour apart, and requires um, 24 hours to be effective. So the therapeutic action is to enhance fetal lung maturity and surfactant production of fetuses between 24 and 34 weeks. Um, it is administered in the medication deep into glial muscle 24 to 48 prior to birth or the preterm neonate. Um, keep in mind that this medication is very potent, so it actually hurts really it's very painful this injection. I received it myself and they had to give it in my thigh and it's just so viscous the medication that it burns but it just it hurts a lot so you just want to make, forewarn the patient. Okay and then they want to once they get this medication they want to uh, monitor the client and the neonate for pulmonary edema by assessing lung sounds and um, they also assess for hypoglycemia and monitor the baby's heart rate. So this is just another little picture to kind of, it's not my time to remember the type of tocolytic medications that are given um, for preterm labor. Then you have uh, premature rupture membranes with this, the PROM or premature, premature rupture membranes. I'm sorry, preterm premature rupture membranes um, with the PP, PPROM. So the P, P, the PROM is the spontaneous rupture of the amniotic membranes one hour or more prior to the onset of true labor. The PPROM is the premature spontaneous rupture of membranes after 20 weeks of gestation and prior to 37 weeks of gestation. So usually this is caused by infection, chorioamnitis, which I already um, discussed what that was, a history of um, prior preterm birth, second and third trimester um, bleeding. So expected findings, usually the mother will experience a gush or leakage of the clear fluid from, bad, uh, from the vagina because this is usually indicating that her water has broken. Um, so you will see temperature with elevation, increased maternal heart rate, uh, fetal, uh, fetal heart rate, um, foul smelling fluid or vaginal discharge, abdominal tenderness. You want to assess for prolapse cord because um, abrupt fetal heart rate variable or prolonged deceleration, or sometimes you need to assess for visible or palpable cord at the introitus. So one of the things that you will see is a positive nitrazine paper test. So usually when they come in, they will um, take a sample of the fluid that may be pooling, which it can be the amniotic fluid, and that will determine if the swab, if it turns blue, that means that the... Um, their water has broken. If it's yellow, then it means that it's still intact. But usually when they take it one step further and they will um, verify it with a, they'll take a, a, that same Q-tip and put it under the micro, they'll swab it under a, a microscope slide and look it under the microscope. And usually if it has this fern-like appearance, that's an indication that they, it's, they um, have a positive fern test. So that confirms again that they have um, the ruptured
their what I'm sorry their bag of waters have ruptured so sometimes you have to prepare for birth in some certain situations obtain a vaginal rector culture just to ensure that there's no infection because that can increase the risk um, of chorioaminitis or or just an infection you know because of the uh, immature rupture of membranes avoid sterile vaginal exams reduce anxiety assess vitals every two hours especially if they're, they're you're assessing the temperature assess fetal heart rate and unit contractions um, adhere to bed rest and encourage hydration and obtain um, CBC and fetal cell count daily so usually we'll give the patient ampicillin uh, to treat the infection and then again they'll give them bethamidazone for um, lung to promote lung immaturity in the, in the fetus so again you wanna um, patient will be DC home if less than three centimeters dilated, no contractions and no um, malpresentation. Adhere to limit activity with bathroom privileges. Do not insert anything in the vagina. Instruct to abstain from intercourse, fetal kick count for fetal movement. Avoid tub baths, wipe from front to back, and take sure to take the temperature every four hours or report if it's 100.4. I'm sorry, 100 Fahrenheit. Sorry, it's towards the end of the night. Okay, so this concludes this portion of this lecture. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Have a good one.